Hello and welcome to Greenfleet Talks. My name is Kate Armitage and I'm your host for our discussion today. I'm delighted to be joined by Callum Slover, Commercial Director at Ingenious. Uh, good morning, Callum. Hi, Kate. Hi. Uh, today, Callum and I will be discussing the wider considerations for operating a zero emission fleet and how fleet carbon savings stretch well beyond the vehicle itself. Callum, by way of introduction, can you, can you give a brief overview of Ingenious and the services that you provide? Yeah, sure. So um, Ingenious's overall mission is to uh, make vehicle movement easy. Uh, for those that don't know, vehicle movement is, is simply relocating a vehicle from one place to another, and that can be either by uh, driving it um, by, with, a, with a driver uh, from A to B or uh, putting that vehicle on the back of a transporter, either a single one or a, a multi-car transporter. So um, the idea of Ingenious is that uh, we believe that there's a, a better way of doing it than it's currently being done uh, today by creating a, a technology enabled service um, that regardless of what your vehicle movement need is, um, Ingenious provides you a one stop shop uh, for you to get that vehicle moved and uh, total transparency in the, in the process. Great. And as a vehicle movement specialist, uh, what steps has Ingenious taken to reduce uh, carbon footprint? Well, we've really built um, a low carbon way of operating into the into the business model and uh, just how we operate day to day. So um, in particular, we, we've got 400 drivers across the, the country who are delivering hundreds of vehicles every day. Uh, those drivers use public transport um, to travel to movements and then travel between movements. That might sound obvious, but it's not the, the way that a lot of vehicle movement operates in the UK today. Uh, the traditional model is actually to shuttle drivers um, between, between jobs using uh, you know, vans or, or, or uh, other vehicles and um, and clearly that has a much higher carbon footprint than uh, using public transport. Um, in, in addition to that, uh, we were talking in the introduction about how Ingenious is technology enabled uh, but, but still a service. Um, part of that, a really key part of that technology platform is actually better scheduling and matching the movements together that a, a supplier might be an, uh, expected to do in any one day. Um, so by reducing the amount of time that they spend traveling uh, we increase the amount of time they spend working and doing actual useful vehicle movement rather than being in a car or being on public transport and traveling between the between jobs, which also reduces uh, their carbon footprint. And, uh, and then finally, we have a sort of a, a driven first mentality, if you like, where uh, we, we try to drive as, as many vehicles as possible rather than transport. And, and again, the reason for that is, is uh, reducing uh, carbon emissions from, from the movement. So particularly with electric vehicles, we, we, we think about trans, uh, driving those first wherever possible, uh, rather than sticking them on the back of transporters, which some people traditionally have thought of the only way of moving an electric vehicle being on a, on a transporter. Absolutely. And it is counterintuitive, isn't it, you know, to have a zero emission vehicle and transport it on a very polluting uh, transporter. So mm. um, I agree with you, it, you know, it's deceptively, it's a deceptively simple business model, but the, the idea that um, the number of vehicle miles that are, that are delivered uh, is much, much lower uh, when you're using public transport is very, very effective. Yes, it, it, exactly. And I, I think there is a bit of a shift in mentality as uh, electric vehicles become more common that people are uh, less uh, just sort of anxious about the range or they might have uh, fewer concerns about um, actually driving those vehicles rather than transporting them. So we are seeing a shift uh, in mentality, but um, you know, certainly I think more people are getting on board with the fact that the, the first impression um, of someone's new electric vehicle they should get is not it being on the back of the transporter, but actually it, it being driven as, in, as it's intended to. Uh, absolutely. And uh, can you, uh, Callum, are you able to give me uh, an example of the saving, savings that Ingenious has been able to deliver for, uh, for one of your customers? Yeah, there's a couple of examples. We're, um, as a company, we're very sort of consultative and data driven. That comes probably from the background of the people that work at the, uh, at the company, which is a combination of people being in, in the fleet industry, but also being outside of the fleet industry. So, uh, we do undertake quite a lot of data analysis exercises with clients and, and we did one particularly interesting one in 2019 when we were working with one of the biggest <clears throat> corporate fleets in the country who was using their workers and their own vehicles actually to um, ferry as we call it ferry drivers to and from uh, servicing visits to the workshop so two vehicles would go one way to drop off one vehicle and then both drivers would hop in and one vehicle on the way back and then the same to go and collect the vehicle so in that process they were traveling 24 miles for every 10 miles of, 
of needed movement, uh, if you like. So they could have just traveled 10 miles if they just used one, one person, one vehicle, but they were traveling 24. And um, so the, okay. the saving from using Ingenious uh, and our model of how we operate in terms of reducing the number of miles driven and therefore the, the carbon emitted was actually really, really significant. Um, so it was a lot of work doing, getting to those simple numbers, but it, it showed how powerful it can be. Uh, absolutely. Um, uh, so um, you obviously deliver a lot of vehicles to fleets uh, and at the point where you've delivered that vehicle, um, what you, mu you must see quite a lot of different scenarios, but what steps do fleets need to take before the vehicle is delivered to make sure that they're ready to operate that vehicle from, from the moment it hits the, the tarmac? Yeah, so I think you're really right to highlight preparation because from our perspective and naturally, I guess the part that we're playing in the, uh, the um, someone adopting electric vehicle in, in the delivery process, the, the key bit that we see is that offer, uh, often the preparation that's needed for, uh, uh, for that vehicle arriving with the person that's then going to be driving it has not been done. Um, and actually that might be the, the moment at which it arrives on the, on the driveway. So charging points not being installed, or the person not being particularly familiar with the vehicle. Uh, it can be immediately before or it can be a long time before. So it might be that the workforces haven't been consulted on who's actually got access to electric uh, charging points or really key who actually wants who wants an electric vehicle. And at the moment, there's a huge variety from what we can see amongst corporate users uh, as to who, you know, varying levels of enthusiasm for, for taking those electric vehicles. Increasingly, people are really keen because they're, they're seen as um, uh, the future and, and, and ex exciting in so many different ways but it's that's not universally true and, and, and actually if you're going to be transitioning your fleet gradually to electric which there's very few that are going uh, doing it all in, in one go then it's, it's obvious but it makes sense to start with the people that are most enthusiastic about getting that vehicle um, just to make sure that the, the electrification of the fleets is as sort of smooth and successful as possible so um, the, for, at least from our perspective, uh, what we would see is the key thing that uh, fleets can do is, is preparation beforehand. So just make sure you know how your your users feel, how well prepared they are for the uh, arrival of that vehicle, and um, just make sure that what they they've got what they need um, to to then use that vehicle effectively. I mean, in, including really importantly, the people that we see do it best have training materials or guides or whatever it might be for users to then refer back to afterwards rather than just relying on although the drivers will be able to you know tell them how to operate the vehicle you know ultimately it might take um someone several weeks to really get comfortable knowing knowing evs inside and out uh, if it's the first time they've driven them so uh, make sure people can learn sort of proactively by themselves as well as um reactively at the point of delivery yeah great it, it's so important and staff engagement you know, if, if you have got an employee who hasn't been engaged in that process, hasn't been given the training, um, it, it, it could end very badly. Uh, and, and as you said, the infrastructure, I mean, um, it, at the moment, there are so many EVs coming to market that the uh, charge port companies are struggling to get uh, infrastructure mm. installed in the timely fashion. So, you know, you have to allow six, eight weeks lead time. I keep seeing these horror stories of people saying, oh, I've got my electric car and I can't charge it. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Exactly, yeah. And so if you're trying to marry the two things to, together, the availability of the vehicle and then the ability of the end user to take that vehicle, you want to make sure that the, the ability of the end user to take it just doesn't present any problems yeah. at all. And there's things that yeah. people do in advance, but as we see it, it's not necessarily being done um, that well across the board. And, you know, and it might be... Uh, it, I would say it's probably more pertinent for plug-in hybrids uh, because, of course, it's heartbreaking if you've delivered a plug-in hybrid vehicle and it's being driven effectively as a petrol vehicle because the training and the infrastructure to support it haven't been, haven't been given. Um, it, it, exactly, and I think that's why it's so important that um, fleets are maybe prepared specifically for the vehicles that they're taking. Um, and it can also be just that the complexity of, um, uh, of some particularly the higher spec vehicles, where it's, it's almost more like operating an electronic, well, electronic device. <laughs> it is an electronic device, uh, but a, a, you know, a, 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 a tablet or a phone or, or, or a computer um, where people feel like they really do need time to sort of um, play around with it and, and really understand what it can do in, in, inside and out. And, and you're right, you know, to get, the, to get the most out of it, whether it's when to charge it, how to charge it, um, what, what's the difference between um, 
owning the, the vehicle in terms of practicality, so to say, um, versus an internal combustion engine vehicle. There's, there's so many things that um, fleets can do to make sure that not only people are generally prepared uh, to take their electric vehicle, but then specifically with that make and model, uh, what do they need to know um, to, to get the most out of it? Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, on, a, uh, on a slightly different subject, uh, I think it's fair to say uh, that we all know that electricity and hydrogen are significantly lower in harmful emissions than traditional petrol or diesel. Mm. Uh, but how, if, you know, if we're talking today about considerations beyond the vehicle itself and, and this real drive to look at the, the wider ecosystem. How can the carbon intensity of the fuel be reduced further? Well, it might it might be an obvious point to some of your uh, viewers or listeners, um, but clearly if you're charging uh, a, a vehicle using electricity, then your uh, the, the carbon footprint of that charge is dependent on how the electricity is generated um, in the grid that's then being used to service that uh, that charge. So um, in somewhere like the UK, where you've got a very high uh, percentage of renewables, that's really good. And often, um, uh, you know, if, if uh, certain providers are, have an entirely renewable um, supply chain um, in terms of the grid behind them, then, then you've got a, effectively a sort of zero emission charge. That's not always the case. <clears throat> across all, all countries and there, there's various uh, schemes out there um, ar around the world uh, to make sure that uh, if you are uh, charging electric vehicle uh, via a certain provider then actually you can be sure uh, that your uh, your charge has as low a uh, carbon um, footprint associated with it as possible so I know there's, there's schemes in Germany um, like that and I guess we should be looking out for similar opportunities just to make sure that uh, people that are essentially adopting electric vehicles are, are doing as well as they think they are and, and the, the charge um, that they're putting into their vehicle then isn't backing off to um, to harmful sources of um, uh, elect electricity supply. It's so different to petrol and diesel where the end user has no uh, no control over the carbon intensity of that fuel whereas with electricity um, actually the time of day that you choose to charge uh, can very simply have an impact on the intensity because um, the grid has a lot less uh, has a lot more uh, carbon intensity in the mornings uh, and in the early evening so if you avoid charging at those times just straight away you're you're being greener in your in your fleet behavior exactly um, I think it's that level of knowledge that uh, we were talking about preparation earlier in the interview uh, preparing people to know that right that won't be common knowledge across all, all users and, and um, you know when fleets are, are rolling out electric vehicles they should make sure that people know those sorts of things um, so that they can, yeah, for example, reduce their carbon footprint by charging at certain times of day or using the trickle charge overnight um, rather than charging at peak times. Um, have, not going to send everyone in genius mode, all that sort of stuff. We're, we're learning as we go too, but there's, um, it just emphasizes how important it is to educate end users. Every, everybody's learning, Callum, and I think the, the whole, you know, the, the message that, that you're, you're giving is um, we've uh, we understand about the vehicles, we understand that ultra low emission vehicles are good and I think that's very well understood, um, but the, the, the point, the message is you've got to think beyond the vehicle itself, you've got to look at that supply chain, you've got to look at where your energy is coming from, um, mm -hmm. and these things are maybe a little bit harder to reach, but it is, it, it is getting better. We've got time for one last question, uh, Callum. So um, what, uh, I think you, when, we've, when we've spoken, uh, you've talked about the benefits of data gathering and benchmarking. Um, you know, why is that uh, important? And can you give me a practical illustration of the power of data? Uh, yes, yeah, absolutely. So I guess talking about sort of carbon footprints and, and, and calculation of carbon emissions is, is inherently about data. And, and it's something that as a company, as we mentioned earlier in the interview, we're, um, we're, we're really keen on, on proving things via data and, and rather than sort of coming out with anecdotes then and showing the impact of, um, uh, of, of various actions by data and, and uh, we can pick up on one other example of a major client of ours a, a big dealership group across the country that's got about 50 different sites and uh, and the impact that could be achieved by driving vehicles rather than transporting them uh, which is, is something else we touched on before 
um, but we've managed to reduce the percentage of vehicles that they were transporting in terms of into dealer transfers so just swapping the vehicle from one site to another um, to, to bring it closer to a, a user that's bought the, the vehicle. Uh, we've reduced that from about 60% to about 30% of their movements uh, with the senior management team effectively putting a ban on uh, on the transportation of used vehicles where it's not necessary it's it's only mileage going on the on the clock um, on, a, on a on a vehicle that's already been driven so um, we, that's just been achieved by presenting those figures to the senior management team each week and saying you know look there's an opportunity here not only to save um, carbon but actually to save costs too so it's cheaper to, to drive vehicles as well as transport them so and, and that's going to be increasingly important, I think, with the adoption of electric vehicles. Um, you know, the, the, the cost the cost calculations are changing. You can see the impact of when you align sort of the economic incentives with the environmental ones. How quickly you can achieve um, you can achieve an impact there, which is is what we did with that dealer group. Well, and you know, it's it's been said many times, but it's very true. The best mile is a mile not driven. Um, mm. First and foremost, if you can cut miles out, then that's that's your starting point. Great, yeah. thank you. Um, Callum, that's about all we've got time for. Uh, it is clear that for fleets to be truly net zero, they must consider the wider ecosystem beyond the vehicle. Uh, and the green credentials of your suppliers is increasingly important and Ingenious mm. has put this front and centre. So thank you again, Callum, for joining Green Fleet Talks. No, thank you, Kate. It's been great to talk to you. Thank you for watching. Uh, please tune in to Green Fleet 365 again soon.